please join me in welcoming our host for tonight, Terry Hart. Thanks very much, Teresa, and welcome to everyone. Our guest tonight has a fan base worldwide and was voted by Time Magazine as one of 2011's most influential people in the world. His Song of Ice and Fire series has sold over 15 million books in 20 languages worldwide, and his latest in the series, A Dance with Dragons, has spent 31 weeks and counting on the bestseller list. Please help me in welcoming celebrated author, screenwriter, and creator of Westeros, George R. R. Martin. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad. Welcome. Quite a crowd. Quite a crowd. Quite a room. Nice screen. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> All for you, sir. This Welcome. is the kind of big screen TV you all need at home. You can see how good the show is. <laughs> well, when it looks this good, you want to see it that big. That's uh, for sure. That's right. That's right. Um, so for you, this creation began back in 1991. And I know that's a while ago. But I'm hoping you can remember for us the scene or the image that launched the series, A Song of Ice and Fire. It was the it was the first chapter of uh, the novel Game of Thrones, not not the prologue, which uh, actually appears first. I wrote that later, but it was the uh, the chapter where they uh, brand viewpoint and they ride out to see the the deserter beheaded, and then they find the dire wolf pups in the, in the summer snow. I was actually uh, it was the summer of 1991, and I was working. It was sort of the middle of my Hollywood decade. <laughs> uh, I was doing a lot of development and pilot scripts and feature scripts, and uh, but I had no particular assignment that summer, so I returned to my home in New Mexico and said, well, I might as well start work on this novel that I've been thinking of for like 10 years, a science fiction novel set in my established future history, and uh, I was writing that and moving along well, and suddenly this scene came to me. I, I didn't know what it was. I knew it wasn't part of the novel that I was writing. Um, it was obviously a fantasy, a medieval fantasy, not a futuristic science fiction thing. But it came to me so vividly and so strongly that I just felt compelled that I had to write it. So I put aside what I was doing and I wrote that chapter and that chapter led to another chapter and that chapter led to another chapter and, you know, at a and certain... And a few more. Certain, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not all there in the summer of 1991. But I knew I was doomed when I drew the map. And then... <laughs> <laughs> then uh, then uh -huh. you had to take it seriously. So I drew a map, and, and uh, but then the Hollywood thing kicked up again, so I actually wound up putting it in a drawer for a few years and returned and did another pilot and you know did another screenplay, and it was all that time that I was working on other projects in Hollywood. I couldn't get uh, this, this world or these characters out of my head. I was being haunted by Bran and Arya and Tyrion, and finally, uh, I, a couple years later, I returned to it, and... Uh, wrote some more pages and said to my agent, why don't you see if you can sell this? And thankfully we did. You certainly did. And you know, you mentioned chapters, you mentioned pages, but when did it change, George, from being a novel to I think there was an idea that it would be a trilogy to now these seven, or you know, we've got five, we're anticipating <laughs> seven, um, massive epic volumes. It, it, well, it, it wasn't a novel for very long, I, but even by the time I sold it, it was a trilogy. We, we sold the first series as a trilogy. I had about, I think, 200 pages that I gave to my uh, agent, and I, I think I attached a, a two-page uh, projection of what the rest of the story would be, because uh, I don't write, like writing outlines. I have never liked writing outlines, so I wasn't going to do a big formal outline of the other three books, but it was going to be three books, uh, Game of Thrones, uh, a Dance with Dragons, The Winds of Winter. Those were your three original titles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, somehow A Dance with Dragons kept receding in the distance as I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I began working on Game of Thrones and it got longer and longer. My original projection was three books of about 800 manuscript pages each, which was long. I mean, my preceding novels, things like Fever Ream and The Armageddon Rag, had been about 500. 550 pages of manuscript. So an 800-page manuscript was was a long book, and fantasies were traditionally longer than uh, science fiction books or horror books. So I thought that would do it. And when I'm writing the first one, uh, you know, I, I hit 800 pages, and the no end was in sight. And <laughs> 
I hit 900 pages and no end was in sight. I hit 1,000 pages and no end was in sight. And by the time I hit like 1,400 pages and still no end was in sight, I said, maybe it's four books. <laughs> <laughs> so I suddenly Clash of Kings was born. And uh, I, I juggled with the structure a little. I moved some of the chapters I'd already written. And I delivered a, basically an 1,100-page manuscript that became Game of Thrones. And I had a 300-page head start on Clash of Kings. <laughs> you were ahead of the game. And uh, yeah, at a certain point, though, I realized, well, four books. Four books is not going to be four books. It's going to be six books. I said six for a long time. I skipped right over five. I did never, <laughs> never fool around with five. I, I started saying it would be six books. And uh, Paris, my wife, who was, who was then my girlfriend, would attend these things with me, and people would ask me how long the series going to be, and I would say six books. And behind me, she would be holding up seven fingers. <laughs> <laughs> she knew better than I did uh, ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I'm saying seven books, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. <laughs> well, we will believe you for now. Okay. For now. Uh, you know, at this point, you know, thousands and thousands of pages have been written by yourself. There are websites dedicated to helping people navigate this labyrinth that you've created and, and keep track of the thousands of characters. Um, how do you keep it straight? What does your writing room look like, your home? Your, how, how do you manage it? My, my writing room is very cluttered and messy, despite my internal efforts to organize it. Uh, but um, less with materials about uh, a Game of Thrones and, and its sequels than you might think. Uh, I do have files on my computer. Uh, I have genealogies. I have many maps. I've been working a lot on the maps lately because uh, we, Bantam has decided that uh, we're going to do a map book. So uh, <laughs> uh, they, they informed me of this, that we're going to do a map book. And oh, and by the way, we need more maps. So, uh, <laughs> so I've been uh, doing some maps. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I have, I have various notes, but actually a great deal less than, than you might think. Um, most of the material is, is actually in my head, and it's not, uh, not written down anywhere. It's, how do I keep it straight? Well, with increasing difficulty is one mm -hmm. answer. Um, I bet. You know, with the earlier books that I wrote, things like Fever Dream and Dying in Light and so forth, uh, I, never, I never kept many notes because I never had any trouble keeping it in my head. Um, but those books were a fraction of the size of, of this book. And the cast of thousands is, is there, and it gets longer and longer. And uh, it is a little harder to keep it all in my head. Um, fortunately, I have some techniques and tools at my disposal that I did not have back in the days when I was writing those earlier books. We use computers now, so I have the <laughs> wonderful search function uh, <laughs> where I can look up a character that uh, I may have mentioned before. and. Uh, you know, see what color his eyes are. I also have the wonderful resource of Elio Garcia and Linda Antonsen in Westeros. And if I'm really stuck, I can, you know, drop Elio an email and say, say, the Lord of thus and such, have I ever mentioned what color his eyes are? <laughs> and Elio will instantly reply, yes, in Storm of Swords on page 412. Uh, he must have a better search function than I do, is all <laughs> I can think, or, or a more encyclopedic mind. Elio, of course, <laughs> runs westeros.org. And for anybody who wants to find out more about A Song of Ice and Fire. I mean, that is the quintessential website to find out everything that you want to know. Um, you know, many fans simultaneously, I think, struggle and rejoice in your, I would say, confidence in being able to kill off main characters. <laughs> <laughs> um, where does that coolness in you come from? I don't know if I really am cool. It's 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 <laughs> surprisingly painful to kill off these characters. Is it? How it do you is. feel about it? It is. I don't want to spoil too much. There, there, those of you, those of you who have read the books, and I'm not sure what percentage is what in this audience of readers Yay! versus viewers, but there there is a sequence in the third book in Storm of Swords uh, oh, Jesus. that I will not refer to by name but it was the hardest <laughs> hardest thing I ever wrote really uh, 
I, I, that, that, I finished that entire book, and that, that scene occurs about two-thirds of the way through the book. And when I reached that scene, I couldn't write it. I skipped over it. I wrote the rest of the book. I wrote all the postlog. And then when the entire book was done, I said, well, I can't postpone it anymore. I have to go back and write this scene. And, and I did. It was and very, how do very you, painful. How do you but feel about it? But it had to be it? done, you know? It had to be done. It's the story. The story has its own demands. And, and does the story take over your emotion? At what point are you channeling your characters? And at what point are they a part of you? I mean, what it, what's that balance when, you're, when you realize you're skipping over a section because well, it's too They're all too a part painful. of me in some sense. They're all born of my imagination or, or you know, my intellect. Uh, in, in they all have some of my experiences in them. Some of them are like me. Some of them are less like me. Uh, some of them have combinations of me and other people and characters from history and people I've known. Um, but the thing that, uh, particularly the viewpoint characters, the ones where I'm actually inside their heads, that gives them life is, is I have to draw on my own, my own emotions, my own life experiences, uh, my own sense of empathy right. um, for even a character who's you know, much unlike myself. Um, and that's, to my mind, that's what the art of, of writing is, is all about. The ability it, to do that, otherwise your characters aren't going to seem, aren't going to seem real. I you mean, you have to put something of yourself in, in your characters. Um, it is a brutal world that you've created. People die. Um, families are ruined. It's war. I mean, we, we are in war when we're reading A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, that is different than a lot of fantasy fiction. Yes. What difference is that to you? And, and you, you know, you embrace the fantasy genre, but those qualities are different than many fantasy books. You know, I, I will say that uh, fantasy is changing, and maybe I had some, some small part in, in it changing. If you read some of the younger fantasy writers who have come along in the last five years or, or so, um, I think their work reflects more of a realism. But, you know, the, the modern fantasy largely grew out of the work of J.R. Tolkien and his great landmark, Lord of the Rings, which looms over all fantasy like a, like a mountain and everybody else is operating in the shadow of Tolkien and what he did. Uh, and my admiration for Tolkien and his work is second to none, uh, I think. Uh, Lord of the Rings is one of the great novels of the 20th century, perhaps mm -hmm. the greatest novel of the 20th century, as it was voted recently by the, the readers of the, uh, the Guardian, I think, in mm -hmm. England, mm -hmm. um, to the fury of uh, some of the people in the literary establishment uh, <laughs> who, who wanted it to go to, like, James Joyce or Nabokov <laughs> or, or somebody, and instead it went to, uh, to Tolkien. Uh, but that being said, uh, following Lord of the Rings, Fantasy was largely taken over by Tolkien imitators who were delivering Tolkien-like books but uh, who didn't seem to capture any of the power of Tolkien and just were borrowing some of his tropes. And some of the things that Tolkien did, which I think worked for him, in the hands of these lesser writers developed into pretty bad cliches and, you know, the whole thing mm -hmm. of the Dark Lord is is stirring and his ugly minions are coming out and you know they're they're horrible minions because they're ugly and they're <laughs> and they wear black and bad. Uh, they have Super a lot of bad. spikes and stuff on their armor and mm -hmm. um, you know and the good guys go forth and they're all like elves and stuff like that and they're really pretty and they they wear white and <laughs> uh, you know the world is not that simple uh, it, it, good guys and bad guys is is fun when you're seven, but uh, you know you should you should look around and see what the world is like and grow more than that. And, and I wanted to kind of reflect to weld fantasy with the historical fiction, and uh, which is more gritty and realistic, and to to capture some of what I see as the the real moral ambiguity of these these issues, because real human beings are not. You can't tell the bad people because they're ugly or the good people because they're pretty. And, uh, you know, I deliberately turn some of these conventions on the head. I mean, the Night's Watch, yeah, they're a bunch of scum, but they're heroic scum. And, and they're protected. And yet they were black, you know, so uh, I was doing that. I took ravens, which, of course, in, in Tolkien and the imitators are these birds of ill omen and horrible things, and I made them a, a basically a good thing, a means of 
of uh, flying from castle to castle and delivering uh, messages and so forth. So Often I, I was messages. I was <laughs> deliberately playing with and and you know the guys in white, the Knights Watch or nothing, the uh, the Kingsguard, Kingsguard, all were white, but it's an institution that was once heroic but is now hopelessly corrupt, full of political appointees and uh, you know people who are venal or brutal or greedy and uh, appointed for anything but the original reason. So I was playing with all of the all of the tropes and turning a few things on their head. Um, one of the things I found reading the books and of course watching the series is I have a lot of friends who have children and they struggle for months, months, on how to name one child. <laughs> one child. And you, sir, have named thousands of people. Where, where does the inspiration for these names come from? Because they, th there's the why, I mean, you've got the Jon Snow, and then you've got crazy exotic names as well. Where do you find all the inspiration for the names? Names are very hard. I that's, bet. That's an interesting question. Yeah, names, names are, are really, really hard. Um, and I need to know the name of a character before I can write about them. I met a writer once. I won't, I won't mention her name. She was a very successful uh, science fiction fantasy writer. But uh, I, I remember years ago, I, I happened to be uh, visiting her in her house. And it was so long ago she was working on her IBM Selectric. So that gives you an idea of how long ago it was. <laughs> Uh, didn't have computers yet, and she she was finishing a novel, and I noticed that there were like no names. There was like X thirteen, X thirteen. Turn it. What you named a character X thirteen? She, oh no no, I, I I have a hard time with names, so I put them in at the end. I see I have this list where I number all the characters like A one, A two, A three, and then I, I write the book with that, and then when I'm done, I invent names for them and use the search, and you know I. You know, just, well, for put X13 is Fred, and then Fred appears. And I, I can't write about Fred unless I know that his name was Fred. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, knowing that he's Fred influences the whole way I write about him and, and so forth. So, uh, so that method of working, uh, you know, different writers work different ways. That was completely alien for me. But um, one of the things about names, when you're, when you're a wee, tiny little writer just starting out, one of the things they teach you is... Uh, when you're writing a story, never give two characters in a story uh, names that begin with the same letter, because the reader will confuse them. And I followed that rule for many years, but uh, then when I was writing Ice and Fire, I said, wait a minute, I'm planning on having more than 26 characters. <laughs> what, what am I going to do here? Am I going to name them like X-Fred? <laughs> Um, so I decided to ignore that rule. In fact, I decided, reading history, I decided to go even further. If it's bad to name two characters, give characters names same. that start with the same letter, mm -hmm. it's really bad to give two characters in the same story the same name. <laughs> uh, so I, I looked at, you know, reading English history, which was the inspiration for that. If, if you read English history, and you guys are Canadians, I presume you know a little of English <laughs> history, everybody in it is named Edward and Henry. <laughs> it's really, you know, the history of England is a history of Edward and Henry. <laughs> and occasionally Richard sneaks in and, and does a little mischief. But, uh, um, and somehow, yet, we, we keep them, we, we attach numbers to them, we attach, you know, secondary names, you know, Edward of Woodstock, uh, Henry of York, or whatever, and we're able to distinguish one from the other with nicknames. And I said, you know, I'm going to do that. That's much more realistic. I'm going to have these these family names, and and like many families I know in the real world, they'll be, oh, I'm naming you after your grandmother. I'm naming you after your grandfather. There was this uh, great king, and you want to curry favor, so of course you're you're going to name your child after the king. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to show all these naming patterns, and they all occur in in the book where you see, you know. Um, Robert comes to the throne, and a lot of children around the same time suddenly seem to have the name Robert in numerous families. But you also see families like uh, the Starks, who keep having a Brandon every every generation, every other generation. There's a Brandon of some sort going back to their ancestor, Brand the Builder, and the Lannisters, who always have the T Y, you know, Tywin, T Tyrion. Tybalt, Tyrion, uh, so forth. Uh, so the echoes of family names and family naming patterns. I also wanted to show the ethnic groups. So mm -hmm. um, you know, the the I have successive waves of invasion that have hit Westeros in this backstory if you read its history. And of course, they started out with the first men, and and the first men tend to have very simple descriptive names like Stark, 
or strong or mud or you know where they're named after something. Sea words. Um, and then the Andals come in, and their names are a little more elaborate, and they don't tend to be named after things. So like Lannister or Arryn, uh, these are these are Andal names. Uh, and then, of course, you get the, the Valerians and the Targaryens coming in who have the very exotic names with all the A-E's and the Y's and the odd spellings like Daenerys Targaryen, which uh, was a pretty exotic name, I thought, and bespoke uh, an exotic past uh, that went well with the silver hair and the purple eyes and so forth. Uh, it is somewhat startling that I receive all these baby pictures on the email of... <laughs> of little girls who are being named Daenerys. And, uh, you know, in a few more years, probably the first wave of them has already hit kindergarten by now. And I, <laughs> there must be kindergarten teachers all over the United States and Canada cursing my name. As they, no, you no, you spell my name with an A-E and a Y <laughs> at the end. 